Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Let's stand together. There is power, power, wonder working, power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working, power in the blood. you be free from the burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb would you be free from your passion and pride there's power in the blood power in the blood come for a cleansing to calvary's tide there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood Turn around and wave at everybody. Let them know that you're glad to see them today. Smile. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in his life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power. I can't hear you singing. Sing it out loud. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. To do service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. Power in the fresh. I want you to sing that chorus again. Do it real loud. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power, precious blood of the Lamb in the precious blood of the Lamb. Good to see you. Y'all doing good? Good. I'm going to give you some announcements because I never do it this time. And I just like to throw things off a bit. You having a good weekend so far? When you sing, if your face is not as red as my face, you're not singing loud enough. <laughs> just for future reference. A um, couple quick announcements. We uh, mentioned last week and started giving refunds on the Cardinals tickets. So if you bought Cardinals tickets... Obviously, the game got canceled, and so we're not going. We have your refund in an envelope, and you can pick that up at that back table on your way out. So the far right-hand corner as you're facing the exit is where you'll find Susan Delaney after the service, and she can give you your refund. Um, did it just get dark in here? Um, cool. I like it. I don't like to see people. Makes, makes me feel like I'm alone again. And I'm not nervous. All right. Um, we're going to take orders for T-shirts. So if you um, didn't get to buy a T-shirt, it's the same design that we've had. Anybody wearing one? 
Drummer's wearing a red shirt. No, that's not the right one. No, he's, he's, he's got the old one. Yeah, he's out of style, way out. Anybody have one of the new t-shirts on? Not that I could see if you did. Oh, Brittany up there. Brittany, turn around. There you go. So that t-shirt right there, if you'd like one, we're, gonna, uh, we're not going to place a mass order. We're just going to take sizes. So if you want to order a specific size or a specific whatever, let us know. Susan can also take that order. I'm sure other people can too, but I can't think of who at this time. So anyway, uh, we're taking t-shirt orders, and we do have some uh, certain sizes left back there. So if, uh, if you never got a t-shirt and you want one, pick those up. Um, also, uh, we're doing a church-wide cookout at Camp Mahaska on July the 26th. So what we'll do is we'll come to church just like normal, do both services, and then after the second service, we will reconvene. We're going to say at 1 o'clock out at Camp Mahaska. So if you come to the 9 o'clock service, you can check out after that and uh, go do whatever you got to do and then meet back up with us at Camp Mahaska at 1 o'clock. If you don't know where that is, uh, you can look up the directions on Google Maps or iMaps or if you're old school, Rand McNally or something, <laughs> whatever. But uh, we'll get you directions. That's on the way out to Blue Springs or Campbell Bridge or whatever out um, highway. What's that, C? What? In. Sorry, in. C is the north side, isn't it? Okay. Out of highway in. Don't, uh, don't get directions from me is what we're saying there. But anyway, July 26th, Camp Mahaska. And then um, we do this every year. We do the baby bottle campaign for Lifeline Pregnancy Care Center. So if you haven't picked up a baby bottle back there yet, it's a little uh, just change container that you can drop dollar bills and uh, your coins, your loose change in. Not that anybody ever spends real money nowadays, but if you do, um, I always just empty my pockets and put it in there. And so it's a great cause. If you want to support that, we would sure appreciate it. And then we'll bring all those back and, and donate the money collected to Lifeline. All right, let's pray together, and we're going to continue with the worship set. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. Thank you for the love that we have in Christ Jesus. And Lord, today we want nothing more than just to be in your presence. Lord, we know that in your presence is fullness of joy. God, in your presence is the help that we need, the healing that we need, the strength, the courage, the peace, the comfort, whatever it may be. Lord, you are everything. You're the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. And so, Lord, we dedicate this time to you. Lord, we want to honor you with everything that's in us. We want to sing to the best of our ability. We want to listen. We want to be attentive to your spirit. So, Father, please work. Please do what only you could do. And, Lord, bless us today as we gather together in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together once again.
grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and let the flood His mercy brings unending love, amazing grace. Sun forbid a shine. Oh, but God who called me here below will be forever mine. Will be forever. are forever mine. Sing like your chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. God, my Savior is ransom me. And like a flood, His mercy brings unending love, amazing grace. Sing it again. Because my chains are gone and I've been set free. God, my Savior, He's ransomed me. Oh, and like the flood, His mercy brings unending love, amazing grace. Oh, unending love, His amazing grace.
Good job, all of you. Good singing. Hey, I forgot to mention um, in the announcements, I, I said this last week, but you've noticed these big old speaker stacks on the left and the right. And I know some, when you walked in last Sunday and saw earplugs in the back of the room, you immediately began praying, oh God, <laughs> what are we doing? Huh? Oh yeah, oh, I forgot to dismiss the kids. You guys should have done that, jeez. Kids, get on out of here. You're dismissed to Children's Church. If you want to go on back, have fun. If you'd prefer to hear me preach, I don't blame you. <laughs> but you can go on back to Kids Church. Um, but anyway, yeah, so those speakers are not so we can get louder. <clears throat> they are actually so we can balance the sound a little better. We're working very hard on that. Because uh, with all the instruments that we have, we push a lot through uh, our system. And it's just too much for these little... That's more like a home theater surround sound speaker right there, and it's just not enough to carry uh, all the highs, the mids, the lows, and so we're trying these out, testing them out. We also brought in a sound tech in the back. I want to embarrass Garrett for just a second. Garrett, wave at everybody so you've seen this guy running around. Uh, he's actually helping us balance the sound. He's volunteered to do that, and he's awesome at what he does, and so I uh, hope that's good for you and it sounds better out there. We want to always give, give you the best experience you can possibly have. Hey, bring up the house lights for us so we can see a little bit. I do want to see faces. I like to see if they're laughing, crying, chewing their fingernails, balancing their bowling average, whatever, during the message. If you want to go with me in your Bible, we're going to go to John chapter 1. John chapter number 1. You know, sound equipment is Murphy's Law. If there's something that can go wrong with it, it will go wrong. And you never notice how good it sounds until it sounds bad. And so anyway, we've been working, as I said, diligently to make that uh, better and get it get it up and running good it's a shame to have such good musicians and such good singers and not be able to hear them the way you should all right was it good all good today I mean I was standing right in front of the speakers and it wasn't too loud for me but uh, I could do that at a Motley Crue concert too though so that's not saying anything but anyway not that I would go to Motley Crue geez but uh, John chapter one we'll move on from that um, I'm, I'm beginning a series today. Um, I just stopped calling my sermons sermons, and I'm going to call everyone a series from now on, just because I'm, I've learned myself enough to know how that goes. But um, I'm beginning a series today called Finding God in the Balance. And um, I, think, I think it's a challenge for all of us to, to discover balance in our lives, but balance is critical to everything, really. I mean, if you're going to get healthy, you've got to have a balanced diet. Amen, y'all know that. Um, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about the mind. You know, in psychology, they talk about having a balanced mindset, you know, not getting out of balance in your emotions or your, your psyche. Um, they talk about, you know, for uh, our earth to thrive, for, for plant life and animal life to thrive, there needs to be a balanced ecosystem. Really, God designed everything to be in balance. God created us to be in balance. And, and I'm going to bring out some things that I, I feel like are critical to Christian living uh, as it pertains to the subject of balance that I want to share with you. And there's a lot of stuff I could get into, um, and, I, and I probably will. Uh, I don't really dance around subjects very often. Um, I don't mind being very pointed and straightforward. I don't ever want to be rude or unkind to anyone um, because I'm just too much like Jesus to do that. Amen. But in reality, I do want to I do want to exemplify the spirit of Christ and never be never be mean spirited toward anybody. But at the same time, there's been a lot of stuff that has been um, sold to us as as Christians and even in our Western culture that um, just doesn't really line up with with biblical Christian living. So hope this will be a help to you. I thought about teaching through this on a Wednesday night, but I felt like it was more something that I needed to share with with everyone on a Sunday morning. Uh, by the way, started a new series on Wednesday night on the book of Hebrews called uh, A Visage, A Vessel, and A Veil. And we're walking verse by verse through the book of Hebrews. It'll be a great challenge uh, to teach uh, through that, but it'll also be very helpful and edifying to those who are here. So I encourage you to come to that. All right, John chapter 1, let's start in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So very obviously the context of John 1 is introducing Christ to the world. Each, each gospel writer introduced Jesus to us through a different lens, same Christ, same God, same Messiah, but J Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all give us a different view 
of, of who Christ is. Matthew, uh, really, if you were to break down the theme of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew introduced Jesus to us as the, the King of Kings, the Son of God. Uh, Mark introduced Jesus to us more as the Son of Man, deals more with his humanity. Luke deals with us, uh, deals with Christ, unveils Christ in a more uh, balanced way, although Luke was a doctor, so he was very meticulous in detail in the way that he wrote about Jesus and uh, just keeping a, uh, just a confluent account uh, of the life of Christ. And then John, uh, the beloved disciple, whose gospel we have selected this morning for our reading, John really deals with Jesus from a more heartfelt point of view. John uh, was the one who at the Passover feast was found leaning on the bosom of Christ. I believe John wanted to get as close to the heart of Jesus as he possibly could. And so we can look at Jesus from an intellectual point of view. We can view Jesus uh, through theological views. But John deals with Jesus as he is in theology, as he is as the Son of Man, but also reveals the heart of Jesus to us. So in verse 15, it says, John, speaking of John the Baptist, John, uh, the one right in the gospel, speaks of John the Baptist, different John in verse 15, saying, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I want to highlight on that last statement in verse number 17. It says that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Father, please touch us now as we read your word, as I try to teach your word. I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit. Lord, I, I'm not just here to give a, an educational discourse or to, uh, Lord, strengthen our, our mindsets or our intellect, although uh, that's part of it. Father, I want you to feed our spirit and strengthen us with might in the inner man. Lord, do as only you can do. Speak to us as only you can speak to us. And then, Father, give me wisdom to teach this and preach it uh, in, the, in the best of the ability that you've given to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I, I find it interesting that of all the things that could be said about Jesus, of, of all of the attributes that could be highlighted in this introduction that John gives us, uh, of all the facets of his deity, and, and, and as he was intricately woven into humanity, that John could have emphasized, the, the sovereign scribe chose to tell us that Jesus, as God and as a man, was full of of grace and truth. It's difficult for me to understand how anyone could be the perfect balance of any two such opposing forces. Now you do realize this morning as we sit here that grace and truth are opposites, right? Uh, to say that someone is full of grace and truth would be like saying that you are equally a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals as you are the Chicago Cubs. It just doesn't sound right. Okay, I'm just testing your blood pressure this morning, and you failed the first test. So to say that a, say that a person is, is equally full of grace and truth, those two things are diametrically opposed, right? Um, and it's difficult to understand how anyone could be the perfect balance of these two opposing forces, but the Bible says Jesus was full of grace and truth. Grace speaks of redemption. Grace speaks of abolishment from guilt and consequential judgment. Grace speaks of boundless love and unprecedented favor. In essence, grace is being let off the hook when we deserve to be left on the hook and hung out to dry. So when we say that Jesus was full of grace, we understand and we sort of, uh, we sort of conceptualize this idea that, that Jesus was the perfect embodiment of forgiveness. He was the perfect embodiment of looking beyond people's faults. He was, the, he was the perfect fulfillment of all things pertaining to love. God is love, and Jesus was the revelation of the love of God in a human form. And so when the Bible says that Jesus was full of grace, it's explaining to us that Jesus was full of unmerited favor. He didn't just possess it. He was the embodiment of love. He was the embodiment of mercy. He was the embodiment of all things good and benevolent toward mankind. And yet, at the, on the other hand, it says, he was also full of truth. Truth speaks of an, an, an immovable reality that exists that most of us like to hide from. Truth reminds us that there are absolutes in life. What goes up must go, come down. That's a truth, right? 
Uh, truth is binding. Truth is law. Truth is judgment. Truth speaks of justice, judgment, and reckoning. Truth cautions us that injustices ultimately cannot go unpunished. So if I am full of truth, that means that I have to deal with something that's wrong. I have to point out error. Truth always shines light where darkness exists. And yet the Bible says that Jesus was full of unmerited favor, the full embodiment of love, while at the same time not looking past our faults and not, not overlooking the fact that we failed and not overlooking judgment. You can't say that God is just all grace and that God doesn't repay or uh, issue penalties for transgressions and wrongdoings, but at the same time, if it does that one more time, I'm switching to the handheld. Okay. Three, four, okay, it's off. Yellow mic. Hey, 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 there we go. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, I won't, I won't talk that loud. But um, I was messing with, just testing the sound guy, just testing the sound guy. Um, but so, so to say that Jesus was full of grace and truth, really, um, we're, we're saying that, that he was the perfect balance between two opposing forces. We're saying that Jesus, being a loving, benevolent, merciful God, at the same time is the judge of all the universe whose eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good, and one doesn't trump the other and one doesn't cancel out the other. Jesus was perfectly full of both grace and truth. So how can Jesus be full of both is the question. Furthermore, how do we emulate that? Because after all, the apex of our pursuit in the Christian life should be to be more like Jesus Christ. I mean, it's what we're striving for. That's what Paul said in Philippians chapter number three, that he said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that I may be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but being in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which comes through his propitiationary death on the cross. So Paul said his pursuit in life, his ultimate goal in life, was to be like Jesus Christ, and that should be the goal of every believer. So if Jesus was the perfect fulfillment, the perfect embodiment, the epitome of grace and truth at the same time, fully supporting the Cardinals and fully supporting the Cubs all at the same time. If that's, if that's who Jesus is and who Jesus was in his earthly life, we have to learn what it is to view the world through the lens of his spirit, to think like he thinks, to have the mind of Christ, and by doing that, we've got to figure out what it is to be balanced in all areas. Situated amid this great passage is an even greater biblical concept, and that concept is that God values balance in our lives. God values balance in our lives. And not only does he value balance, but it is in the balance where we find the heart and the mind of God in most, if not all, situations. Now listen very carefully. I don't know if you're grasping this concept just yet. But it's easier to dwell in the extremities. It's easier. I found that in my own Christian life. When I got saved, I discovered that it was easier for me to jump into a very radical form of Christianity. Because I have always been radical. When I partied, I partied hard. You know what I'm saying? When I, when I, when I lived the way I lived, man, uh, I didn't play. You know what I'm saying? Like, I quit school because of recess. I don't play. And so when I got saved and when I became a Christian, I just, it was just, it was very easy for me to, to gravitate to the most extreme form of what I would call a semblance of biblical Christian living than it was for me to discover that there's a balance to this whole thing. And again, there's a danger of dwelling in the extremes because when I dwelt in that extreme form of Christianity, I pushed a lot of people away that I could have drawn to Christ. And when I lived in that very rigid mindset, that very judgmental, I'm better than, and, you know, I never walked around with like thinking in a cognizant fashion like that I'm better than you. That mindset really wasn't part of who I am. But at the same time, by the, by the way that I lived and, and the way that I preached and the way that I presented Christianity to people, it was very repulsive and repelling and made, made it seem like Christianity was some you know, high form of humanity that you have to strive to arrive at. 
When in reality, the Christian life is found in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And so it's easier to dwell on one side or the other. We see that in politics. <laughs> right? Y'all American here? Y'all watch the news ever? Turn on Facebook, which is now the new news, I guess. Um, you know, it's easier to, to dwell in, a, in, a, in, in right-wing politics or left-wing politics. It's, it's easy in, in different social discourses to, to take a very radical position on a thing. Instead of looking at it and taking in all the information and all the facts and not worrying about who says what or who thinks what or how's this going to make me, you know, what, what's this going to do for my image, a balanced perspective is taking in all facts and thinking through it and praying through it and weighing all things in the balance and coming to a balanced position on a subject. But it's easier for people, it really is easier just to flip to one side or the other. So I want you to think about this. Uh, in the days of Jesus, when Jesus walked on the earth, there were two extremities of Judaism. Somebody shouted out at me. Two extremities of Judaism, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? Just to split the church, we'll make the right side the Pharisees and the left side the Sadducees, okay? So in Jesus' day, we had the Pharisees on one hand, we had the Sadducees on the other hand. The Pharisees were all about law. These people are legalistic, judgmental hypocrites is what they are, okay? The Pharisees were all about law. Uh, they, they meticulously observed ordinances, washings, holy days, Sabbath rituals. Uh, they had religious wardrobes. They had certain things that they had to wear to prove to you how spiritual they were. Just look at them. It's pathetic. But so the Pharisees were all uh, uh, about their rigid principles, all about the outward display uh, of, of religiosity or spirituality, as it were, and tan tantamount to their, to their rigid uh, principles was their public displays of piety and outward holiness. They loved to pray, the, uh, Jesus said, in the marketplace, right? That'd be like going into Walmart or Applebee's or somewhere very public and, and stopping everybody. Saying, I want to get your attention. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. And I want everybody to stop what they're doing and listen to me as I pray. And they, they love that stuff, man. They, they, they really just, they thrived on presenting themselves as being spiritual, these Pharisees over here. But then you had the other group, the Sadducees. The Sadducees really didn't believe anything much. So the Pharisees on the one side were very superstitious, very religious, very dedicated, all about not only law, but they also, in many cases, law, uh, their, their laws or the, or the Old Testament laws were trumped by their own tradition because by word of mouth as the prophets and the priests and, and the elders and all those developed like these, what we would now call extra biblical standards or extra biblical laws, um, they took those things, those those teachings as, as being just as valued, they highly valued them just as much as the very written word of God. So, so the Pharisees were the exact opposite. They rejected all that stuff. Like they, they recoiled at the idea of legalism. Uh, the Pharisees were extremely pragmatic. So, so you have the Pharisees who are very superstitious. The Sadducees were pragmatists. Everything had to be practical. Everything had to have a logical element to it. They, they, they were Gnostic in their belief system. They, had to, they, they, they valued knowledge and, 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 and just very basic things that we could sort of calculate and pinpoint. Uh, they didn't believe in things like a literal resurrection. They thought when the Bible spoke of resurrection, it was sort of a figurative way of speaking. There was no such thing as a literal resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons or any, really even any idea of, of spirits of any kind. The Sadducees didn't believe in that. That's why they're sad, you see. <laughs> the jokes don't get any better, folks. Uh, the Sadducees, they were, uh, what else can I say? They were very intemperate. Um, where the, the, the Pharisees, you know, really lacked balance when it came to law. They were very stringent and strict teetotalers. The Sadducees were a bunch of lush drunks that didn't really care about God's law. These people. Opposite to their legal, legalistic counterpart, the Sadducees always looked 
for loopholes in the law to excuse their de- degenerate behaviors. So instead of so so again, grasp the grasp these two opposing forces here. Okay, so 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 opposite the Pharisees who who the law of God was not good enough, they made up their own laws. Okay. As if the Ten Commandments were not, not enough, guys. you got to make up your own stuff. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were looking for loopholes in the law like, well, does it really mean I shouldn't kill people? I mean, does it really? And so the Sadducees were just, they were always looking for ways to excuse their, their really their, their loose and debauched behavior and uh, always looking for loopholes in the law of God. Didn't really value the things of God that highly. They had a form of, of godliness, but as the Bible says, denied the power thereof. And, 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 and in reality, the Sadducees, again, were pragmatists. They, were, they, they based everything they did on logic. So uh, in our day, just to put this in our modern mindset, modern vernacular, in our day, we would refer to the Pharisees as right wing and the Sadducees as left wing. Three of you are listening. Do you guys just want to join me on the stage? Uh, right wing Pharisees, left wing Sadducees. They both were very arrogant and proud, either of their adherence to the law or their lack of adherence to the law. So over here on this side, the Pharisees beat their chest because they were so holy and so righteous and they were better than you. The Sadducees were like, man, we're wicked and proud of it. We don't care what y'all say, and they sort of rubbed it in their face. And it was almost like a reverse legalism because they sort of went back and forth at each other. Uh, While this side, again, they were wrong for, for really worshiping the law, this side was wrong because they just dismissed everything. Like everything was cool, everything was groovy, nothing was wrong. You can't tell me not to do that. So here's the opposite, right wing, left wing. In, 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 in all things pertaining to God, right? Like if you would have asked the Pharisees, they felt like they were right with God. They were doing right. If you would have asked the Sadducees, they felt like they were doing right. Which by the way, they both had a hand in seeing Jesus crucified on a cross And may we never forget that it wasn't the drunk or the harlot that nailed Jesus to a tree. It was religion that did it. So here's where I'm going with this. And I know what you're thinking. I'm glad to know you're going somewhere with all this. When the Bible says Jesus was full of grace and truth, when we, when we follow the life of Christ in the Gospels, we find that Jesus equally rejected and Jesus equally condemned both parties. In fact, the only people that Jesus really picked on, and, and we could say was a little bit mean to, were these two groups. Wherever Jesus went, common people flocked to him. In fact, the, the Gospels record, it says the common people heard him gladly. That means rednecks like you and me, just normal people, came to Jesus in droves. But everywhere Jesus went, lurking in the shadows, were these religious hypocrites, these Pharisees and these Sadducees, and everywhere Jesus went, he really decried both sides of the aisle and said, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you scribes, woe to you Sadducees. He said to the Pharisees, he said, you're like whited tombstones, you're like whited sepulchers, you may clean the outside and you want to look good on the outside, but the reality is on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. He said to the Sadducees, listen, you guys aren't any better. You do the same stuff, and you dismiss the law of Moses, and you you pretend like you're spiritual, but you know that you don't really have any sense of the presence of God in your life. So Jesus really rejected both sides of the aisle and was found in the balance. Now, here's the problem with, with, with dwelling in a balanced place in life, especially when it comes to Christianity. When you, when you find the middle ground, when you find the balance, you'll get shot at from both ditches. Because the extreme right wing will say, you're a liberal. You don't believe nothing. You bunch of limp-wristed, compromising, no-suit and tie-wearing to church liberals. And then the left side will say, you're legalistic because you do believe the Bible. And, and you do accept God's word as being truth, and you do let God have the final say so. And so in the middle, you, you listen, you find that middle lane, you're going to get shot at from both directions. And it's a balancing act. 
It really is. It's like walking a tightrope, trying to find the balance because naturally we're going to get off balance on our own. And then as the winds of adversity blow, we're going to get thrown off balance by people and pressures and different ideologies. Things are going to come our way. By the way, we live in a world where we're just constantly flooded with information and opinions So you're going to get tossed around and knocked off course. This is why Paul told the Galatian church to not be soon shaken. Don't don't get thrown off course. Learn what it is to, to find this balance and walk in this balance because you will find God in the balance. If you let me listen to any two opposing opinions on any particular subject, I can almost guarantee you the truth is not over here and the truth is not over here. The truth is somewhere in between. There's an old saying in marriage counseling or relationships. They say, you know, there's, there's his side, there's her side, and then there's the truth. That's true in any argument. Unless I'm involved, then you know where the truth is in that particular scenario. But it's reality, right? And so um, this is kind of one of those I'd rather give you a fishing pole than a fish type thing, Right? Y'all follow that. You don't need me to give you the old Indian, you know, that said, anyway, okay, the old Native American, sorry. Um, but um, this is one of those things I'd rather, I'd rather give you this concept that you can apply it in all areas than to specifically deal with everything, albeit I'm going to deal with some specific things, okay? So I'm going to talk to you about finding God in the balance. Did you enjoy the introduction? Because we've only got about 45 minutes to go. Just kidding. You're the smart ones. You come to the 9 o'clock and know that I'm on a time limit. Okay, Um, so (laughs) the 11 o'clock service either really likes to hear me preach or they just like to sleep in, one or the other, but they didn't think about the fact that I have no restraints in the 11 o'clock service. I can say what I want to say, and nobody's going to tell me when to stop. All right, so finding God in the balance. First thing I want to talk to you about is the balance between the logical and the mystical, The balance between the logical and the mystical. I know that's kind of an ominous thing to say, so let me illustrate it this way. It's our custom to pray before we eat. Amen? Now, sometimes we pray over the groceries and just figure we're good for the rest of the week. (laughs) But you can be legalistic about it. Told you before, Tatum, every time we pray, if I called Tatum up here right now, and he would probably, by the way, come up and pray in front of everybody because I don't think he's got any shame in him. Uh, but every time Tatum prays, he opens his prayer. And I know you're supposed to open your prayer with our Heavenly Father or our Father with Chartner or whatever. He opens his prayer with God, thank you for the food. Every prayer, no matter what we're praying for. Um, but, but, but we sit down at the supper table, bow our heads, and give thanks for the food, and then we eat. Isn't this a good illustration so far? Someone has prepared the meal. Someone set the table. And at the end of supper, if you call it dinner, you're a Yankee and we reject you. But at the end of supper, someone's going to clean up the incredible mess left behind by five, arguably six kids that live in our house. Here's what I'm trying to say. We We don't sit at an empty table where there have been no preparations made and expect God to fill our bellies and nourish our bodies. We do our part, and then we thank God for the provision. You would look at me crazy if you came to my house, and I invited you over for a meal. And I said, man, we're going we're gonna to eat high on the hog. It's around here, that means we're going to eat good. Jeez. We're going to eat good. You come to my house, we're going to eat good. All right? Depending on how many children you have will de- determine how good we eat. <laughs> if you have a lot of kids like I do, it'll probably be burgers and hot dogs. If you're married with one or no children, we might have steak. So I'm saying, we're going to eat good, though. We're going to do something. We're going to grill out, amen, and eat good. You would think I was crazy if I invited you over for a meal and we sat down at an empty table, no plates, no silverware, no food. You walk in, you don't smell any fried chicken, you don't smell anything cooking, And I sat down and began to give thanks for the food when there was no food. Now, as simple as that may sound, that's the balance between logical and mystical. 
We make preparations, we do our part, we sit down at a tangible meal, and then we give God thanks for allowing us to prepare, to plan that he provided, and we, allow, we thank the God of heaven, in a spiritual sense, for blessing us and taking care of our needs, right? Uh, here's an even funnier one. This one always cracks me up, and this is just for my own personal humor's sake, so you don't have to laugh at it, but it's always funny to me when we sit down at a, at a table full of junk food. Or better yet, I've actually gone out to, uh, for dessert with people, um, and sitting down for dessert, they'll say, well, let's pray first. Number one, I don't think you need to pray for dessert because it's blessed already in my eyes. <laughs> Do you really need, does it need a double blessing? I think dessert's already blessed, but I've gone out to eat just for dessert, just, just eating dessert with somebody, and so let's pray first. And as we pray over all these carbs and calories and sugars, they'll say something like, and Lord, use it to nourish our bodies. And I've done it, praying over fried chicken and mashed potatoes and gravy. You know what I'm saying? God used it to nourish our bodies. And I'm thinking, well, really, do you expect that to nourish your body? And as silly and as simple as that illustration may sound, we do the same thing in other areas under the guise of spirituality, right? We do, other, we do that in other areas and pretend like it's spiritual. We make no preparations. We make no plans. We don't put in the work that God's given us the ability to do. And then we want God to bless it. We don't want to put forth the effort, even though the Bible says that we are to be diligent, that whatever our hand finds to do, we're to do it with our might. We're to work and we're to be strengthened and strong and we're to educate ourselves and we're to nourish our own, our own bodies and nourish our own spirit and soul and mind and pursue God in prayer and pursue God through different means of going to the house of God and doing all these other things, and yet we want to do nothing and then pray at the end of it and expect God to bless nothing. You're either quiet because you're not following me or you're quiet because you understand you're going, crap, that applies to me. I mean, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me how, how we, we, want to, we want to discredit God or criticize God when bad things happen in our lives when in reality we haven't really been seeking after God until it all hit the fan. And then when things fall apart, man, then we want, well, where, where's God and all this? Well, you haven't been, you haven't been searching for God. You haven't been pursuing God. So there is a balance between logical and mystical. There's a balance between, between what is spiritual and what is natural, and it's misleading at best to be constantly seeking signs and superstitious manifestations of God when God said, listen, I'm here to speak to you in plain words and in plain speech, and Proverbs tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. If we'll seek wisdom, we'll get understanding, and, and we're looking for God in the mystical when God says, listen, I have made myself available to you. Most of the time in the New Testament, when you follow the life of Jesus Christ, I'm going to take some heat for saying this, but it's okay. Most of the time when you find Jesus healing someone in the New Testament, there was also a tangible act involved with the healing. Take up your bed and walk. You want healing, do what you can do. I'm going to heal you, but I'm going to heal you when I see your faith put to practice. Go show yourselves to the priest. And, and in their journey to show themselves to the priest, those ten lepers were cleansed. Oftentimes when Jesus performed miracles, last week we looked at the miracle of the feeding uh, uh, of the 5,000 plus, right? We looked at the miracle of the five loaves and the two fish. Jesus could have performed a miracle out of nothing. In the Hebrew, it's called ex nihil, out of nothing. God can just take something out of nothing. He's the only one who can do that. And yet God, in Jesus Christ, took a little boy's lunch and fed about 15,000 people at one time. He didn't need that little boy's lunch, but it was the expression of, that, uh, expression of that child's faith that set the miracle into action. See, we just want to call down the mystical all the time. We're just wanting to pray down things out of nowhere, when in reality, God says, here, I'm going to give you the ability to do this, and then what I will do is I'll take up the slack where you, where you can't do it, what is outside of the natural, what is outside of your own abilities, then God says, I will show you a miracle. Commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts will be established, the Bible says. Commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts will be established. You will understand in that moment, God will either give you the wisdom to do what you didn't know how to do or God will say, here, I'll pick that up for you since you don't have the power to do it and you don't have the ability to do it. You do what you can and let me take over for the rest. 
Now, here's what Jesus said, Matthew chapter 12, verse number 29. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. An evil, again, speaking to religious people, an evil and adulterous, that's an unfaithful generation, seeks after a sign. And then he goes on to say, and there will no sign be given unto them but the sign of the prophet Jonah, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He said, the only sign you're going to get is when I conquer death. When I rise from the dead, that's the only sign you're going to get. Everywhere Jesus went, everywhere Jesus went, cracks me up, actually, because I have a twisted sense of humor, but everywhere Jesus went, he would heal the blind, he would cleanse lepers. He raised dead people on a couple of occasions, walked on water, fed multitudes, opened blind eyes, opened deaf ears, gave people who were unable to speak the ability to speak everywhere he went. And yet, the religious crowd that followed him on his journeys constantly were saying things like, show us a sign that we may believe. If you would give us a sign that you're the Son of God, we'll believe it. And therein lies the problem with seeking signs and being superstitious. You're never satisfied. You always need another thrill. You always need another ecstatic experience. You always need another platitude. You always need another high. It's really, it can become addicting. Where instead of being grounded in, in the truth of God's Word and being rooted in the faith that's in Christ Jesus, we find ourselves constantly thrill-seeking. And that's how we define our spirituality. It, it, the background that I come from, some of y'all are looking at me funny, so maybe you don't get this, and it's okay. But the background that I come from, we would say things at the end of a service like, boy, it got on in there. Boy, it got on tonight. And there's nothing wrong with that statement. I do like it when it gets on, right? But what we meant by that, what we meant by that was that a lot of people were shouting and they were getting in an emotional frenzy. And I'm for emotions. I'm not criticizing being emotional. I'm a little emotional sometimes. So I'm not criticizing that. But that's how we quantified whether a service turned out good or whether the service was not so good because conversely if it didn't happen we'd say boy it sure was tight in there boy god didn't have any room to move as if god only moves in the mystical right some of y'all come from different backgrounds that that if people didn't run an aisle or fall on the floor or slain in the spirit speak in tongues if that didn't happen well then god's presence just wasn't there because god's presence can only be verified what are we doing Miracles happen. <laughs> God's presence can only be verified if something, if something superstitious happens, if something mystical happens. By the way, the Apostle Paul pretty much throughout the whole book of 1 Corinthians dealt with this imbalance in the Corinthian church. Because in the early days of the church, God, God poured out his spirit in miraculous ways, and I don't think that has ceased. I don't think that the miracles and all those, I don't think God has ceased that. The Holy Spirit's just the same today as he was 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. I don't, I don't discount that. But, but the Corinthian church got, got so hyped up and so addicted to it that they would fabricate it whether God showed up or not. They would, they would, they would make it happen. Like they would, they would put on a show. Like, if, if God didn't show up, they were going to go through their same theatrics, whether it was the Spirit of God or whether it was being done in their own physical bodies. And so he dealt with this imbalance, and particularly in, in the latter part of 1 Corinthians, he, he deals with this stuff, and he says, look, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than a hundred words in an unknown tongue. I'll, I'll, speak, I'll pray with my understanding, and I'll pray with the Spirit also. I'll speak with my understanding. I'll speak in tongues more than all y'all. But he said, listen, I would rather be able to share a truth with somebody that they can take with them than for the unlearned to come in and not understand what we're doing. Because God's not the author of confusion, and the primary thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and God wants people to be born again, not into an ecstatic experience, but born again into the family of God that they might live for all eternity with Jesus Christ and the saints in heaven. 
So there's nothing wrong with, with seeing God in the mystical because God does sometimes work. We say it, God works in, but watch it, he doesn't always work in mysterious ways. He does sometimes, but don't always look for God in the mystery. Elijah, running from Jezebel, found himself in a cave, just discouraged and depressed. And the Bible says that when Elijah was sitting there and seeking God, at a very low point in his life, by the way, it's, it's amazing to me how, how quickly we can go from, from plateaus to valleys. And, and, and Elijah went very quickly from a, from a high place in his journey to a very low place of discouragement and darkness. And, he, and as he was sitting there in his despondency seeking God, it says that there was an earthquake, a great rumbling, but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a great wind began to blow, but God was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was a fire because, you know, God had just previously spoken through Elijah in fire on Mount Carmel. But now it says God wasn't in the fire. But after the earthquake, after the wind, and after the fire, it says Elijah heard a still, small voice. And that voice was God's voice. And by God speaking in a quiet way in that moment, God was telling Elijah, would you please stop putting me in a box? Because just, just because I spoke through an earthquake in times past, and just because I spoke through wind in times past, and just because I've spoken through fire in times past does not mean that I will always speak in those ways. And so you, having my spirit, need to learn what it is to discern the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I will fall in fire, but sometimes I'm going to talk to you very quietly. So stop seeking signs and start seeking him. Realize it's not about the manifestation. It's not about the mystical. It's about the God who does all things well in his own perfect timing, and we can't fabricate the presence and the manifestation of God and his spirit. We have to learn what it is to balance the logical in and the mystical. On the other hand, equally dangerous to being excessively pragmatic, always looking for God in the logical realm, we find that God does sometimes speak in the mystical. Here's how balanced I am, in my teaching at least. It's just as dangerous for us to always be seeking God in the explainable. See, now I'm trying to garner the support of the rest of you. I'm not really, but there's a balance to this, right? It's, 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 it's equally dangerous to be excessively pragmatic. It's equally dangerous to be inordinately logical, thinking that God is always going to work in ways that you can calculate. So, so, so to continue my food illustration, because I'm so fond of food illustrations, years ago I read a, uh, uh, the biography of George Mueller. Y'all ever heard of George Mueller of Bristol, England? You need to study history a little bit more. So George Mueller of Bristol, England, I read his, I read his biography several, several years ago. It's, it's been a while now. Um, but, but George Mueller was a Christian evangelist who opened uh, schools and orphanages all over England in the 1800s. Um, last time I checked, I think he opened over 10,000 schools across England for, for disadvantaged children to get an education and somehow try to pull up out of that situation in their life. Uh, but one thing that stood out to me in this story, this biography of George Mueller, was um, they ran out of food one day at their orphanage in Bristol. Again, I told you food was coming. And the workers came to George and said, um, we have no food for the children. We have nothing to feed them. Our, our cupboards, our pantry is completely empty. We, we don't have anything, no grain, no corn, no bread, nothing to feed the children. What are we supposed to do? And George Mueller said, set the table. They said, but George, we have no food. He said, set the table. So the... Workers in the orphanage, following their leader, foolish as they felt, set out the plates, the cups, the silverware, the napkins, and then they set all these orphan children down at their tables. George Mueller comes in a few minutes later and sits down at the head of the main table. 
He sits, as he sits down there, all eyes are fixed on him, and George says, let's bow our heads and give thanks for the food. No food, yet they bow their heads, and George begins to pray, and he says, God, I want to thank you for providing all of our needs. Lord, I know that you'd never leave these little orphan children to be hungry. You said that your, your, your people, the righteous, have never been forsaken, nor your seed begging bread. So I just want to thank you for your provision. Thank you for the way that you have provided everything that we possibly need. We want to thank you for this meal. And as he prayed over a meal that wasn't there, a knock came at the door. A food wagon had busted a wheel outside the orphanage. And they came to the door and said... Uh, We've had a terrible situation. We're carrying this food. I forgot where they were carrying it. They said that it's going to spoil before we can get this wagon wheel fixed. Is there anything you guys could do with this food? And they said, yeah, I think we can find a good use for it. So equal to there being a danger in always seeking God in the mystical, there is a danger of us always looking for God in what can be explained. Because we serve a God who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. So you might be sitting there this morning saying, well, where do we find God? Do we find him in the logic? Do we find him in the miracle? Do we fi where do we find God, the mystical or the explainable? Where do we find God? And my answer to you is yes. Sometimes God does work in ways that can be explained. Stop thinking that God is always going to provide in ways that can't be explained. Sometimes you might be praying for a need and someone that you know and love or maybe somebody that you don't know and you don't love comes to you and says, hey, God you know, told me to give you this just out of nowhere and man, boom, what a miracle. Other times you might be praying for a need and God says, man, in my life there have been times I've been praying for needs. You know, Most people like me get in the ministry for all the money and uh, I found out quickly that was a false reason to get into the ministry and, and, and especially in the early days, man, there'd be times I'd be praying uh, for a miracle, praying for God to send some provision. I'll never forget this. I may have shared this story with some of you before, but, uh, but Stephanie and I, uh, first year, I think maybe second year we were in the ministry, uh, we were, again, we were in full-time evangelism, and we were holding a uh, revival meeting or a camp meeting or something um, down in Panama City, Florida. It's a shame. The only time I've been to Panama City was for church. But anyway, um, that was the carnal side of me coming out just because I like to be balanced. Um, but we were in Panama City, Florida, and... Uh, Man, it was, one, it, was, it was one of those meetings. And I don't know if y'all have ever been in church services like this. If not, you're better off for it. But it was one of those church services where, um, and this is why it always cracks me up when people say, oh, preachers always talk about money. First of all, I rarely talk about money. Second of all, what's wrong if I do? Anyway, I digress because I can feel the tension in the room. <laughs> Might be because it's so sacred to you that you get nervous when we mention it. But... Anyway, we were in this meeting, and our, our buckets aren't up here because we're not taking up the offering like we normally do, um, but, uh, but, but the guy that was leading the meeting was walking around with the bucket. I'm talking the offering bucket or plate or whatever they had at that time. God said we need to raise $10,000 in this meeting. I swear there were like 50 people there, if that. I'm serious, dead serious. Maybe 50 people there, and... Uh, I mean, he wasn't giving up. He wasn't quitting. We were going to raise $10,000. Well, I didn't have but about maybe 25 bucks total. I'm not, talking, I'm not talking cash. I'm talking total. And it was in my pocket. And uh, he just kept milking this thing. We need to raise $10,000. Who's got $1,000 that they want to give to this meeting? This is southern stuff. You know what I'm saying? You go deep south, it gets weird. I ain't kidding you. You go deep south church, it get, there's some weird stuff goes on down there. You go up north, it's the opposite. Pharisees, Sadducees. Um, <laughs> But he just wasn't giving up, and man, I was like, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, it wasn't one of those times I really felt led. I told a story last week about feeling led to give. I didn't really feel led in this situation. But I was like, this sucker ain't going to quit. So I just emptied my pocket through what I had. I mean, it was all I had. I mean, if he was looking for a $1,000 seed offering from this old boy, he was hurting for certain. Through what I had. And, I, and that was the last we had. I didn't have any grocery money, didn't have nothing. We lived in a little camper, 32-foot camper, travel trailer that we pulled around. And uh, we went back to the camper, and uh, man, we just, we just broke. I'm not saying we didn't have any food in the, in the camper, but it wasn't much. And uh, 
the poorest preacher, I believe it or not, was not the poorest preacher. I don't mean preaching ability. I mean monetarily. I was not the poorest preacher. I was probably the poorest preacher as far as preaching is concerned in that meeting. But the poorest preacher, monetarily speaking, came and knocked on our door and handed me and Stephanie like five bags of groceries said, Lord told me to give you this. That's how poor I've been at one time. A poor preacher gave me food. <laughs> you ain't poor till a poor preacher gives you food. And he gave us food, you know. But then there have been other times when, when we were praying for needs and somebody would say, hey, man, I need help putting a roof on a house. I'll pay you, you know, 15, 20 bucks an hour. Help me roof this house. I'd say, shoot, yeah, I'll take it. Nowadays, by the way, I won't roof a house for less than 40 an hour if you need me. <laughs> I ain't hurting that bad anymore. But I'm saying, here's what I'm trying to say to you. Sometimes God does work in the mystical Sometimes God will bring stuff just out of nowhere. Sometimes a poor preacher is going to bless you. Sometimes somebody who has nothing. I shared a story last week about God just gifting us in an amazing way. Uh, from the least likely source, God just blessed us, and, and, and that's what catapulted us into the ministry. And then other times God will say, you know what? Let's go wash some cars and make some money. Why don't you go mow some grass and make some money? And I'm not just talking about those types of things. This applies to every area of your life. Sometimes God does work through the miracle, miraculous. But then on the flip side, the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. You don't always have to have some mystical movement, some mystical, unexplainable manifestation to know the mind of God. The Bible says that we have the mind of Jesus Christ. Blake, if you would come to the piano, it would speed me up. Sometimes I just wink at him. Sometimes he needs a sign from heaven. <laughs> but if you guys would come on, I'd appreciate it. I'm good. I got through an introduction in one point. I feel good about that. There were three points to this message. This is why I called it a series. But where's the balance? Where's the balance between the mystical and the logical? Where's the balance in all that? The balance is realizing that God is full of both. God can take nothing in your life. If you have nothing, you can sit down and give thanks at a table when there is no food. And your God will supply your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And then there are other times that God will speak through very simple reasoning. See, those who are always seeking signs kind of reject anything that appears logical. Well, that, that can't be God. That makes sense. There's no way God's in that. As if God only works in things that don't make sense. But then those who are overtly pragmatic tend to only see God in what we can figure out. And by the way, if, if we only as a church saw God and what we could figure out, we wouldn't be where we are today. So we've got to learn what it is, watch this, to let God be God. Let God do the work that only He can do. Trust Him. Seek Him. Seek wisdom. Pray. And believe that God's going to provide and be sensitive enough to the Spirit to know when it's God at work. This is, I've tried to make this pretty simple, but it's a really deep truth. Because the essence of it all is we have to learn what it is to discern the Spirit of God. And in order to discern the Spirit of God, we've got to throw off all pretense. We can't pretend and put on a show and act like we're something we're not at the same time we've got to learn what it is to seek him in spirit and in truth and walk in a balance some of you will be excited to know that later on in this series we're going to talk about the balance of life itself and how we reconcile spirituality with living just daily life because sometimes it seems diff opposite don't it like you feel like you got to put on your Jesus hat when you go to church and then when you go somewhere else you got to well now I'm you know what I'm saying when the great misconception is genuine spirituality is not found 
in the divide. It's found in the unification of all things spirit, soul, and body. Let's stand together this morning. I, I could talk about this for another hour. But we've got to learn what it is to find God in the balance. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd help us this morning. I feel deep down in my spirit that this is one of the most important truths that, that we can con grasp in, in our concept, in our heart as believers. Lord, there is so much in this life trying to throw us off kilter, off balance. But Lord, help us to find the balance where we can walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust and the passions, the inordinate desires of the flesh. Touch the heart of every person here. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here who does not know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation, that you'd speak to them and awaken them as only you can. In Jesus' name. I said it all. I gave announcements already. Look at me go. Cool. Well, we're ahead of time then. Shoot. Sit down. I'll give you point number two. All right. Well, come back next week. We'll pick that back up. And uh, love to have you all on Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, my family and I will be 
heading out for a little mini vacation this afternoon, so if you need to get a hold of me, if it's an emergency, you can reach Jesse at 867-5309. Just call that number. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. If, if you do have an emergency, Jesse will be checking the messages here at the church, or you can get a hold of him if you have his cell phone number, or you can call on the Lord in emergency. Get it? Never mind. My jokes are bad, I get that, but they're not that bad. Could give me a courtesy laugh or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're funny, you funny. Okay, yep, so, uh, but yeah, we'll be gone for a few days, so again, if you need anything, reach out to someone on our staff. If it's an emergency and you need to get in touch with me, they can reach me. All right, by carrier pigeon, they can get a hold of me. Father, thank you once again for giving us this time. Lord, we pray that you'd bless us as we part ways today. Keep everybody safe. Bring us back together in your timing. In Jesus' name, amen.